Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise your name. He can be seated if you can. Hallelujah. I think people are beginning to believe that again. That he still can. And that he still will. Yeah. Well, I've tossed over the oil, the what would need to be tonight for several days. Well, I tossed over this morning, and I knew you can depend on the Lord for what's right. And man, did he prove himself right this morning, that he knows what he's doing in the ways of the Spirit. If you'll follow him, that's the key. If you'll follow him, he's not nervous. I see preachers get nervous. I don't know what I'm preaching tomorrow. Well, I, and I'm nervous about it. Well, I'm not nervous because he's never let me down yet, ever. And I've learned that whenever Saturday night is a bust and the heavens are brass and there's nothing coming, that he's got something better than, than I could come up with in the morning. And thank God he's proven faithful again today. Last Sunday morning in Houghton, Louisiana, Shreveport, Bossier area, Pastor Jeff Gravis preached gold. I'm telling you, the man preached heaven. He preached gold. And when I, when I heard it, I thought, Mauriceville Assembly of God needs to hear it. And I, there's nothing I can do to improve on it. I could note it out and preach it myself, and guess what? There's nothing I could do to improve on it. So tonight, if you will allow me, I know it's unusual, but we're going to listen to Pastor Jeff Gravis preach one of the absolute best messages for today I have heard in months, weeks, and possibly years. And that is no exaggeration. Jeff is right here from Eva Dale. He planted the church at Eva Dale in his hometown about 20 years ago. Now he's pastoring up in Houghton, Louisiana. And I'm just going to let him speak for himself from here on out. If you would, give your attention as, as if we were right here and live because it's going to speak to your life. I promise you. Can you do that? Amen. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus is speaking and he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Father, we just once again thank you for your word. And we ask for the anointing to continue to work in this service today. Lord, I pray for your spirit to rest upon each of us and help us to draw close to you in everything that we say and do that Jesus may be glorified and exalted in your precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated this morning. Tomorrow, our nation will celebrate 246 years of independence. Amen. Some of you were here for the start. Amen. One of those people who wasn't here at the beginning was Brother Hearn, who has a birthday today, 29 years old today. Happy birthday, Brother Don. There's two great things born in the month of July, Brother Don and America. Amen. But already in this service, we have been reminded of our reason to celebrate this grand achievement of liberty. In a day and age in which patriotism is looked down upon and even mocked by some, I am thankful to God that I am an American. He has truly shed his grace on this country. I'll never forget the first time I was able to go to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. and see with my own eyes the original Declaration of Independence. My eyes welled up with tears as I took in the names of those 56 men who signed that magnificent document. Had there not been a lot of people in that room trying to get up there to see it, I probably could have stood there for hours just looking at those names. I know I am a history nerd, 
It's your problem, not mine. There's two things that I love to talk about, Jesus and history. Amen. So if you want your eyes to glaze over, just throw something out there and let's talk about it. But the signers of the Declaration of Independence were so unlike the weak incompetence that we see so often in our leaders that hold the reign of government today. They were not drifters or rebels. They were civilized men standing, men of standing who were willing to sacrifice their substance, even their very lives for the sake of liberty. Pseudo-historians today may blame an entire litany of societal ills on them, yet they set in motion the longest ongoing constitutional republic in the history of the world. We should understand that the blessings of liberty we enjoy are not by chance. They are not accidental. They are from God. In the 246 years since its founding, America has been a force for good in the world. We are the only country that fought a war with itself to end slavery. We are the greatest missionary sending nation on the planet, carrying the gospel of Christ to all points of the globe. Most of the greatest technological achievements that have benefited mass mankind in the last 150 years have found their origin here in the United States. Let us not forget also that America, called the arsenal of democracy, help rid the world of Hitler and Mussolini and Tojo. The benevolence of this nation has fed the hungry, clothed the naked, defended the defenseless, and sheltered the homeless the world over. Recently, though, Gallup issued a poll that discovered a record high. 50% of Americans rate the overall moral state of values in the United States as poor. Another 37% say it's fair. Just 1% think the state of moral values is excellent, and 12% think it is good, and they all live in Washington, D.C. The current poor rating is the highest on record by one percentage point. That our nation has fallen from the lofty ideas of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, there is no doubt. There are a lot of factors that could lead to such negative results as this Gallup poll, but in my opinion, and my opinion is going to carry the weight today because I get to have the microphone. But in my opinion, it has been the silence of the pulpit that has most affected society at large. A couple of years ago, I was on an Assemblies of God minister's Facebook page, and there was a debate raging amongst AG ministers as to whether or not it is appropriate to even have an American flag in the sanctuary. Now, let me be clear. It is not a vice to love your country, and it is certainly not a virtue to despise it. Honestly, I was horrified that there would be ministers in our fellowship who carry the same credential card that I do that have a, such a poor opinion of this country that gives them the freedom to have such a poor opinion. In fact, as soon as I read that, I walked in the sanctuary to see if we had a flag in here. I never even thought about it. And there was no flag. And so I went and found, I don't know why it had been moved or whatever. There may have been a play or something. I'm not saying there was any nefarious things. It just wasn't in here. But guess what old Jeffro did? I grabbed the flag and I put it up here just to spite. It's not worshiping the flag. It's not worshiping this country. I worship God. But there are those that have a poor opinion of our nation. And sadly, there is an entire movement afoot in Christian circles that say we should focus on preaching the gospel and stay out of anything that smacks of anything political. Now listen. Y'all heard, if you were here a few Sunday nights ago, Brother Gene Summers were here, and he told you what politics means. Poly is a Latin phrase that means many, and ticks is a blood-sucking parasite. We understand all that. We know what it's all about. But America, these people tell us, they say, is evil and will be destroyed anyway, so we need to focus on spiritual things. However, this is in a direct contradiction to what the Word of God teaches Take, for example, the letter that the prophet Jeremiah wrote to the Jews in Babylon. 
Jeremiah chapter 29 is, has one of the most famous verses in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 11. I'm not going to quote that for you, but I want you to look at verse 4. He is writing to people in Babylon. America is much like a modern Babylon. I'd really say more than Babylon or more modern Sodom and Gomorrah. But be that as it may, Babylon already had doomed pronounced upon it. But God instructed Jeremiah to write this letter to the Jews who were in captivity. And listen to what the Lord says. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom, I've, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace you will have peace. For those who were living as strangers in a strange land, the Lord gave five specific rules about living in Babylon. He told them to build homes, to plant gardens, to start families, to seek the peace of the land, and to pray to the Lord for its peace. Friends, I want you to know we live in America, and we should do the same thing for our country that we live in today. It is absolutely essential that we as believers... Work for the betterment of our society in which we live. The gospel of Jesus Christ is for the whole man. When Jesus saves us, he does in a work in our lives that is seen in every aspect of our way of living. I am not one who foolishly believes that America is going to get better and better and then Jesus will come back. But I do believe that as salt, the church is a preservative. The moral decay of our nation can be slowed by God's people, ensuring that more people come to know Jesus. The greatest generation, that generation that gave us the founding of our nation, were, part, were for the most part a people of faith. Yes, there were some like Thomas Paine who were not believers. But for the most part, they were believers. And the principles they set down in our national birth certificate are principles that speak through the ages. I want to use as a subject the lesson of the founders. Their lesson is our heritage today. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would say in his famous speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1963 when the architects of our great republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men Yes, black men as well as white men would be guaranteed the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Dr. King would use the lesson they set forth to challenge a nation, to challenge a people. While not all of the founding fathers may have been Christian, even those that were atheistic were Christianized. In other words, they were so influenced by the Judeo-Christian concepts of right and wrong, good and evil, that it influenced every decision they made in life. We can look at their example today that is based upon the truth of Scripture and be that preserving salt to this generation that God has called us to be. So what are those lessons that we learn from the founding fathers? Number one, and if you're taking notes, I'm going to warn you in advance, I have ten points. We don't have church tonight, so we'll end right around six. I'll get through it all, don't worry. We first must learn from our founders that our rights come from God, not the government. Our rights come from God and not the government. In Genesis 1, 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The founding fathers hit upon a principle that they considered to be self-evident. As Jefferson wrote, and we know these words, if you've ever been in a history classroom, you've probably heard them before. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, 
liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It was not the United States government that gave me a single right in my life. It is God Almighty who gives to us the rights that we enjoy today. They are not given by a government. If they were given by government, government could take them away. Jefferson called them unalienable, which means they cannot be taken away. When the Constitution was ratified, soon thereafter, the Bill of Rights was given. These were not rights given to citizens by the government, as many so misconstrue them. These were rights that belonged to the citizens already, and which the government was told, you shall not infringe upon them. The purpose of government is to secure liberty and to keep safe the blessings of liberty. Somewhere along the way, we have come to the mistaken notion that our liberties come from the government when they do not. Sadly, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of government overreach into our lives, and people have willingly given up rights that were given to us by God. I'm here to tell you that on this Independence Day weekend, let us not forget the lessons of our founding fathers that rings through the ages. It is God that gives us right, and not man, and not government, only God Almighty. Number two, we learn from our founding fathers our citizenship is hev is in heaven does not negate our responsibilities on earth. Our citizenship in heaven do not negate our responsibilities on earth. Paul says in Acts 21, verse 39, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Sicilia, a citizen of no mean city, and I implore you, permer permit me to speak to the people. Paul said, was telling them, I am a citizen of Rome. In Philippians 3.20, Paul says, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a man with two citizenships. He was a citizen of the Roman Empire, and he was a citizen of heaven. There are many today that say we're citizens of heaven, so we should not worry about the affairs of men. The founding fathers were not people who denied the reality of heaven, but they knew there were realities on earth too. Jefferson said in the opening of the Declaration of Independence, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them to another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. He realized there were earthly laws, natural laws, that were given, but these were given by God. It showed a duality of what was going on. Paul was a man who was familiar with the dual citizenship. He knew that his citizenship in heaven gave him obligations here on earth. Our rights come from God, but it is the responsibility of we the people to defend those rights. Christians are to be the best citizens in the land. Prophet Micah says, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Our salvation makes us citizens of another world, but because I belong to another world, I am an ambassador on this planet and I must do everything I can to make sure that I live up to the responsibilities that God has given me here in this land where I live. I have responsibilities to my family. I have responsibilities to my church. I have responsibilities to fulfill for, for our nation that we live in. And by God's grace, we all need to take up that responsibility. Say, yes, I belong to Jesus. Yes, I belong to heaven but I've got a purpose here on this earth as well. Number three, y'all, I'm going through them fast. Number three, we must learn from the founders, assault in this earth, we are not divided by politics, we are divided by right and wrong. Let me say it again, because I think we need to get that this morning. We are not divided by politics. We are divided by what's right and by what's wrong. The writer of Proverbs, King Solomon said, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. The separation from Great Britain came because the government had become destructive in the words of Je Jefferson to the unalienable rights given by God. So Jefferson wrote in that magnificent document that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter 
or to abolish it. It was not a divide over simple politics. It was a divide over right versus wrong. There was a time in America when there was very little difference between political parties. Most people who went to the bowls voted for both parties and went down the, the, the list and they didn't vote for party, they voted for the person. And they were proud of that, but I feel that that is not the case anymore. You have one party that is just full of maniacs. And another party that's filled with fewer maniacs. We live in a day and age where the wicked are justified and the just are condemned. The prophet Isaiah wrote this, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I'm here to tell you that our guiding principles as, as people of God and what, how we vote, how we act in society is all found in this book. I realize that some may say, well, that's antiquated, that's an ancient book, and it doesn't have anything to do with the day and age in which we live, and I'm going to tell you something right now, you are absolutely wrong, it is a timeless book. The nations of this world will crumble and fall, the earth will be dissolved in fire, the grass withers, the flower fades away, but the word of our God will stand forever. I will choose to stand on what God's word says every single day. And I realize that in this day in which we live, that a lot of people say, if you preach the Bible, you are nothing but spewing hate speech. Let me help you out right now. It is not hate speech for a doctor to tell you that a cancer will destroy your body. It is not hate speech for a doctor to tell you there is something wrong in your life. Neither is it hate speech to tell you that sin will take you to a devil's hell, but Jesus Christ can save you if you'll just let him. I don't let the times define the Word of God for me. I let the Word of God define the times that I live in. And I'm here to tell you, it's not politics that divides us from other people. It's the Word of God that divides us. I remember one time in college, 1992, in case you're wondering, I, was, I would go two days a week. Me and my buddies would meet up in, in a restaurant in the student center called the Red Bird Perch. Terrible name for a restaurant. Me and my buddy, we were sitting, my two buddies, we were sitting there in our booth, minding on my, our own business. They had just called my number and I had my cheeseburger basket sitting in front of me. I could eat back then with no guilt. <laughs> I gained five pounds just saying cheeseburger basket just now. And I had a, another guy that I'd gone to school with from Evadale in the booth behind me, and he had some girl, I didn't know who she was, with him. And he turned around and he asked me a political question. And I just gave him a correct answer. I don't know how it happened. I don't know exactly what happened. But the next thing I know, this girl was in my booth having a meltdown over what I had just said. I mean, she was, she was raising her voice in the bird perch. I was dipping my french fries in my ketchup and watching her have a meltdown because the, the issue was abortion and she went totally berserk over what I said in that, what, which was biblically correct. I wasn't rude, I wasn't crude, anything of that nature. And this girl is sitting across the booth from me, yelling at me, <laughs> screaming at me. A few weeks later, me and this girl named Ginger were getting on the elevator in the library at Lamar, and Ginger and I were talking, and as we got, was getting on the library, the doors opened up and there was that screaming lady. And the first person she saw was my friend Ginger. And she said, hey, Ginger, how you doing? And they started talking to each other. And then she realized, she looked over and she saw that I was with Ginger. And she said, you're friends with him? <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> Ginger said, yeah. She walked off. Ginger and I got on the elevator. The doors closed. And Ginger said, what was that all about? 
I said, that girl's crazy. Ginger, I'm telling you, she's nuttier than a five pound fruitcake. She yelled at me for no reason, Ginger. She didn't like what I had to say. I don't know, I never saw the girl again. I don't, she may not have even finished college. She may have, I don't know. She may not have never finished college. Back then they didn't have cry rooms like they have today. Guess what? I finished my cheeseburger basket. She ain't ruining my meal. No sirree, Bob. Our divide was not political. Our divide was moral. I was polite to her. She was impolite to me. I love her, whoever she is. Jesus, I hope she knows you. She knows Ginger, so maybe Ginger talk to her later. Number four. Amen. We're moving along, y'all. Silence is never an option when evil grows in the land. Silence is never an option when evil grows in the land. Listen to what Paul said to the church at Ephesus, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. In the Declaration of Independence, before listing the particular reasons why the colonies were separating from Great Britain, Thomas Jefferson wrote, let facts be submitted to a candid world. And then he gives a long list of particulars of abuses done by the crown. What was he doing? They were giving voice to the injustice foisted upon them by the crown, and they would not remain silent in the face of evil. The great German theologian, pastor, spy, and martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer so eloquently wrote, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Thank God for that great man of God who was not ashamed to put a finger in the face of Nazi Germany and call them to repent over their sin. He would end up being executed two weeks before the war in Germany ended at the orders of Hitler. Bonhoeffer had a friend by the name of Martin Niemuller. He was a pastor in Germany. He had been a war hero in World War I, a submarine commander. At first, he thought Hitler was good for Germany, but when Hitler began to interfere with the church, he spoke up against Hitler, and he spoke forcefully against him, even from his pulpit, and he would spend years in a concentration camp in Germany, and so after he was released, he wrote a little poem called First They Came. He said, first they came for the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. Friends, I'm here to tell you something in this cancel culture. Don't let them counsel you, cancel you from saying what is right and what is wrong. Don't be ashamed to stand up for truth and for righteousness. It doesn't matter how much they scream and yell and say, we're going to boycott you. We're going to shut you down. We're going to stop you from saying anything that offends us. We don't like what you believe. We don't care what you stand for. I am here to tell you, we cannot be silent when evil is roaring around us. We have have to lift up our voice and say something in this generation in which we live. As citizens today, we must learn from the founding fathers and be willing to speak up about the evils in our society. Number five, we learn from our founders who showed us what it is to be salt. Not only are we to render to Caesar, but we are also to keep him accountable. Jesus said it. I'm sorry I had 2 Kings right there. It should be from the book of Mark, I believe is where I got it from. Jesus said this, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And look what they said, and they marveled at Jesus for saying that. Jefferson put it this way, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. We have a privilege that the first century believers did not have. We 
are actually able to hold our elected officials accountable. Not only are we to pay our taxes, but we should also get out and vote because this is also a form of rendering under Caesar. Do you think for one minute the apostles would not have voted on whether or not to keep Herod as king? Do you think they would have not wanted a referendum on the power of Caesar as emperor? In their day, they did not have the power, but they used what power they had to change the hearts of an empire that would turn it around. Our responsibility is not only to change hearts, but also to hold elected officials accountable to we the people. We should hold them to the standards of decency and honor. We should reject those who seek not the good of the people, but only for the good of themselves. It's time we realize that Caesar may not be willing to change, but when we go to the ballot box, we can change Caesar. Number six, we learn from our founders that loving our neighbor means actively engaging in the process so their lives can improve. Because I love my neighbor, I'm going to be involved. Matthew 22, 39, Jesus said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The founders knew that when the monarch abused his power, he would, he would in essence, abuse his subjects. Jefferson gives a list of particulars against the king, and it begins with this one. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. In other words, what the king is doing is affecting everybody. It's affecting the public. If you love your neighbor, you're going to do what you can to do good for them. The reality is there is much suffering in this country today because of decisions that were made at the ballot box were, that were made before was ever made in Washington, D.C. Let me back that up because it sounded garbled because it was. Has your mouth ever gone faster than your brain? It's not hard for my mouth to do that. <clears throat> there is much suffering in our country today because of decisions that were made at the ballot box long before they were ever made in Washington, D.C. In the 30 years since I have been able to vote, life has always been the number one on the ballot for me, and it still is. Economic policies that reward hard work and are not punitive to success is important to me. Crime and public safety are of concern. A strong military and support for those who are serving and those who have served is important. Opposition to those who would legislate immorality has also been a top priority for me as well. Because the Bible commands me to love my neighbor, I'm going to let that affect what I do at the ballot box. We learn from our founders, number seven, if you're keeping note, we learn from our founders that to be disengaged from the process is not spiritual, it's sinful. I'm going to let y'all stir on that a second. Therefore, James says, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. In the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson wrote, prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by, by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. Most people in the revolutionary time were satisfied with the status quo. That was certainly in the case of the revolution. According to historians, one third were for the revolution, one third were opposed, and a third didn't want to get involved in any way whatsoever. In our society today, many view a lack of involvement in the process as a kind of spiritual badge of honor. They're too spiritual and too lofty to be involved. Why should they care about the trivialities of this moral co mortal coil? James lets us know that if you know to do good and you don't do it, to you it is sin. God intends for us to be salt in this society, but too many people choose to remain in the salt shaker. It was their faith that spurred the founding fathers to get involved. Men of faith must lead the way in our day as well. That the lesson of the founding fathers does not, is not missed. We have a stake in this thing and we must speak up. We also learn from our founders that God is glorified when his people work in unity for the sake of righteousness. Jesus said it in the same chapter that I read my text from, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In the Declaration of Independence, the founders 
were unified in their goal under the banner of heaven. Jefferson wrote, we therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. I believe it was Franklin who said when they voted on July 2nd for independence that at that moment it was like 12 clocks had all chimed at one time. In the same section of scripture that Jesus talks about being salt, we're called to be light. The founding fathers were heir of men like John Winthrop, who in 1630 preached to his fellow passengers on the, the ship Arabella just before they disembarked at the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And he said that this colony would shine, be like a shining city on a hill. America, when united around what is right and good, has always been a beacon of hope for the world. As the poem at the base of the Statue of Liberty reads, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. The chief export of America should not be evil. It should be the gospel of Jesus Christ. The founders taught us the lesson that unity around righteousness glorifies God, and we must be like-minded. We also learn from our founders that the Bible illustrates the cruel injustice of a corrupt system and the necessary of spiritual conviction, bold proclamation, and Christ-like love. In the book of Acts, Chapter 4, we see the disciples of our Lord. They had been imprisoned for the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were threatened not to preach in his name, but they prayed, Now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. The founders were fighting a system that had become punitive to the systems, to the citizens it was supposed to protect Jefferson wrote the history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over the states. They didn't just wake up one morning and decide to be independent from Great Britain. It was after a long train of abuses and petitions from the colonies that they came to this point. In our day, we must be like the first century church and behold their threats. Seek the face of God and ask God for the courage to stand for him. It has been through prayer that we've seen the Supreme Court overrule Roe v. Wade. They also, in the last month, stood for the protection of religious liberty and Second Amendment rights. It has brought much hope and excitement for the future of our nation. May we learn from the founders and have a great spiritual conviction, courage, and Christ-like love, and hold fast the line of freedom so that our children can likewise know what America is meant to be. And finally this morning, and everybody said amen. Some of you feel like I started this in 1776. Finally this morning, we learn from our founders it is a matter of life and death. Can I say it again? It is a matter of life and death. Moses said, I call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. The last sentence of the Declaration of Independence before the 56 signers affixed their names is powerful. For them, it was a life and death thing that they were doing. They wrote in for the support of this declaration, and with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives and fortune and our sacred honor. These were people who were men of wealth and means that were willing to give everything they had for the cause of freedom. Are we like those brave men who are willing to risk everything because it's about life and death for us today? Are we willing to look at the war zones that are our cities? and say enough is enough, the killing needs to stop? 
Are we willing to address the evils of illicit drugs such as fentanyl, which is the number one killer in America that is pouring across our southern borders today because of lawlessness? Are we willing to address the insanity of policies that are causing food and fuel to skyrocket that is destroying the livelihoods of people? We're reaching a point where people are having to decide between paying for gas and food or paying their mortgage. Most are not willing to admit it, but we are in a, re a recession. And because the current administration is weak, we are seeing what is happening in our nation, and we need to pray God change the course of our country. Just this week, there was an exchange between, us, between CNN and a Biden administration advisor. And listen to what it said. I should have played the clip, but I'll read it to you. The CNN reporter asked the advisor, what do you say to those families that say, listen, we can't afford to pay $4.85 a gallon for months, if not years? The Biden administration advisor, Brian D says, this is about the future of the liberal world order and we have to stand firm. He said that standing in front of the White House. That's from the guy who got 81 million votes. I didn't say 81 million voters, I said votes. <clears throat> They're going to cart me off to jail, and all of you clapped with me, too, for just saying that. Now yeah, you're clapping for me to go to jail. Thanks a lot. I've always wanted a jail ministry. <laughs> Send a loaf of bread with a saw in it for me, please. And the thing about it is, is they don't care about you. They care about the liberal world order. That's what they care about, the liberal world. They don't care that you can't afford to pay for your kids' medical bills. They don't care that you can't afford to get to work, that you have to make a decision between bankruptcy and putting gas in your car. I'm going to tell you something right here on the authority of God's Word. It is immoral what they are doing to this country. And bless God, preachers need to stand up and say something about it. It is absolutely ludicrous. And it is a matter of life and death. It is a matter of livelihood. What happened to the government being there to ensure that we have those natural rights given by God of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Jesus, help our nation today. If this, this gets out on Facebook, there'll be people in the Assemblies of God whose heads will explode because I'm saying this. Well, if they had anything in their heads, they wouldn't explode. Say, Pastor, you're supposed to preach the gospel. Listen, it is the gospel. I'm a shepherd of my sheep, and I see how it's hurting you. And these miscreants in Washington, D.C., who drive around in their limousines while you're the ones that are paying the, footing the bill for it, and they could care less that the American people are, are suffering because of their decision that they're making. I'm here to tell you today, it's time we rise up and say enough is enough in Jesus' name. I may not be able to see Russia from my house like Sarah Palin, but I guarantee you I can see November from my house, and there's a lot of people we need to send packing in Jesus' name. We must learn the lesson of the founding fathers. It always is on the ballot for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Perhaps my message today is one that's made you uncomfortable. If my musicians would come, please because it seems that we're too much focused on national affairs. And if you're going to be baptized, you go ahead and go and get ready for that as well. You say, well, I may miss something. I'll tell you in the baptismal tank. <laughs> you know, if we filled that baptismal tank up with gasoline, we could buy a new church. 
<laughs> Maybe it's made you feel uncomfortable. And look, that's not my, my desire to offend people. It surely is not, because I love everybody. I've always had, I've had friends on all spectrums of the, the political debate. I've got liberal friends, friends that don't agree with me. They send me messages sometimes, say, I don't agree with you, Jeff. I send them messages back saying, I don't care. You're the ones that's wrong, but <laughs> I love you anyway. They love me. We love each other. We can, you know, we can be disagree without being disagreeable. They're not going to know if we don't show love. Amen. But our freedoms, our freedoms that we enjoy in this nation have afforded us the greatest opportunities the world has ever known. Because we have been a free people, the United States of America was and still is the chief exporter of religious freedom throughout the earth today. Because our chief export has been the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must learn the lesson of the founders. May we once again call upon God in repentance for our nation, for our unwillingness to take a stand. And that will be a people who fully understand that the only true freedom that there is, is found in Jesus Christ. I'm not here to save America, but I am here to save Americans through the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am not, I'm neither a pessimist nor an optimist, I'm a realist. And I know that America will not long endure. Lincoln said that in the Gettysburg Address. A nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal, it cannot long endure if it remains divided. I realize that this nation will one day be no more. But as long as I have breath in me, I will fight and try to be salt to preserve a nation so that others may know Jesus. And so the gospel can continue to go to the ends of the earth. Would you stand with me this morning? Can we just pray right now for our nation? I know this is not a usual Sunday morning service, but sometimes there are things that need to be addressed from the pulpit. This was one of those days. Let's pray. Father, we lift up our nation to you and we pray for its good. We pray your blessings over our nation. Lord, we repent for the national sins that we have embraced in the past. Forgive us, O oh God, for being nominal Christians and not being the salt and light that you've called us to be. Lord, your word tells us that we are to pray for those in authority. And while we may have very strong disagreements with them, we pray for them. I lift up President Biden to you, God. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would help him and his family. And Jesus, give him wisdom, his administration, those that serve with him. Lord, I pray for those in Congress that you would do the same for them. God, I ask for those on the state and the local level. God, that you would move in their lives and be with them. And Father, I pray that your people would rise up and do what is right and true in Jesus' name. And we give you praise for it today in the strong name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, give him praise in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Stand Thank you, me. Jesus.